This is the third equation on planar systems for Chapter 2 in ODE, and in this lecture I will finish talking about the solutions for the eigenvalues and show you the corresponding face portraits. I'll also talk a little bit about equilibrium solutions for the system. So for a quick review, we have a system of two first-order linear differential equations with constant coefficients and we write it in a matrix form here and abbreviate it like this where y is the solution vector and a is the coefficient matrix, the 2 by 2 coefficient matrix. And we made an assumption that the solutions, which are x of t and y of t, had the following closed form solutions. Some constant vx or vy times e to the lambda t. So we, so we took this and we put it through this differential equation. Remember this, the, we have a solution vector and we substitute this, this proposed solution into the solution vector. We end up with e to the lambda t factors out and then a vector v, which is uh, the vector made of these coefficients. Okay, and we put it into that differential equation and we do some rearranging and we get the following equation. So here's the equation that we get, a minus lambda i times v equals zero. And using the terminology of, of linear algebra, lambda is the eigenvalue, the vector v is the eigenvector of the matrix A. So now we're going to expect two solutions and two eigenvectors, two eigenvalues and two eigenvectors in general. Now if we have two eigenvalues, then we really have two solutions. We would have oops, x1 equals say vx1 e to the lambda 1t and we'd have an x2 and another one vx2 e to the lambda 2t and then similarly for y1 would be vy1 e to the lambda 1t and then you'd also have a y2 which would be vy2 e to the lambda 2t. All right, so we could write that we have one solution vector y1 x1 y1 which would be e to the lambda 1t times v1 which would be the matrix composed of these. Then we could also have another solution vector which is y2 x2 which would be e to the lambda 2t times another eigenvector which would be v2 is composed of vx2 and vy2. Now if these are linearly independent they form a basis for this two-dimensional solution space so all solutions can be written as linear combinations of them. This is what I've written here. This would be the first linearly independent independent solution and here would be the second one and then uh, the C1 and C2 are constants used in the linear combination. So we have a sort of a plan uh, already mapped out here based on our initial assumption and um, we'll see how, how it will go in the, in the next couple lectures. But right now we have to go back and find out how we're going to find these values for lambda. And in the previous lecture, by using mathematical reasoning, we decided that the, de the determinant of a minus lambda i had better be zero. That means we have to find lambdas, values of these eigenvalues, such as the determinant of a minus the eigenvalue times the identity matrix is zero. We write out all the components, and we end up with the characteristic polynomial, which is a quadratic the eigenvalue squared minus the trace of it matrix A times the eigenvalue plus the determinant of matrix A has to be zero. So using that, I'll write it up here again just so you can see it. So we have, no, I, I will never learn. Okay. We had lambda squared 
Remember, it's a negative sign here. Okay, so we can write the quadratic formula for the solutions for the two roots, lambda 1 and lambda 2. Okay, there's a style point here. I just kind of want to point out the text in some places write the following. And I, I just think it's a d plus or minus square root of t squared minus 4d all over 2. Okay, I'm just going to point out that there's benefit to not doing that. It's much better to write this t over 2 out in front, write the plus and minus here, and then write the rest back here. It has physical significance if you're drawing the graph. This t over 2, this leading, comp this leading term right here, what is that? That's the x location. So you had some function of x of the vertex of the parabola. This, is, of course, is a parabola. Plus and minus, this term takes you out to the, to the roots of the parabola as they cross the x-axis. Okay, so it has meaning when you graph it. The second thing is that when you have complex solutions, this is the real part and this is the imaginary part. So it's just a lot better to separate them out as two separate entities and not, not write it like this. But that, again, is just a style point. Okay, so proceeding on, let me erase that little diatribe. Okay, here we go. We're going to have the possibilities are two distinct real roots, two equal real roots, or a complex conjugate pair. And this is just basic algebra all over again. All right, if you have two distinct real roots, then the two roots, lambda 1 and lambda 2, are not equal to each other. And this happens when the determinant here, t squared minus 4d, is positive, or t squared is greater than 4d. You have two equal, equal real roots when that determinant is 0, or t squared is equal to 4d. And you have a complex conjugate pair when t squared minus 4d is less than 0, or t squared is less than 4d. Right, this is just exactly what we had for the harmonic oscillator case, except in that case we would have always had um, we would always had the attenuation. When we had an attenuation e to the alpha t, depending on how you write it, this would be negative. It would be um, it would be a um, damp sinusoidal wave. Here, in general, we're not restricted to that. So we're doing a more general case than the harmonic oscillator. But we have similar solutions. Now each type of those roots that we have, each, each category, will give rise to a characteristic phase portrait. So if you have two equal real roots, you can have a source synchro saddle. For a spiral, they're complex conjugate pairs. Okay, for the ray in the single tangent system, and then of course either this is zero or they're both zero. So we'll look first at the case of two real distinct eigenvalues. That means lambda one is not equal to lambda two, and there were three possibilities. One was a saddle. One is a source, and one is a sink, uh, in a different order up here. It depends on the signs of the eigenvalues. If they have different signs, like for example, or it could be vice versa, lambda 2 could be less than 0, lambda 1 greater than 0, it doesn't matter, you will have a saddle. If they are both negative, You have a sink, and this is the case of that overdamped harmonic oscillator. If both are positive, then you have what's called a source, greater than zero. Now if you have complex conjugate roots, okay, you have Okay, like that, alpha plus i omega, then if alpha is zero, you end up with a center. 
because that's purely os oscillatory. So we have the purely oscillatory case of the harmonic oscillator. If alpha, this real part, is not zero, but it's negative, then you have a spiral sink. If it's positive, you have a spiral source. The spiral sink was the um, underdamped harmonic oscillator. So we've covered those cases. We have one case left to cover. And now we have the case in which we have that the two eigenvalues are real and equal. In this case, we can have two patterns, and it will depend on the eigenvectors. Now, we're not going to do the eigenvectors in this chapter because finding the eigenvectors is very contingent on which case of eigenvalues you have. So we'll do those in the, in, in the preceding lectures or in the future lectures. Okay, so you're going to have two possible patterns, though. If you can get two line linearly independent eigenvectors, you'll end up with what's called the ray pattern, and that just looks like what you would think it would look like. Let me find the line here. Ray. Ray's coming out like this. Okay, whoops. Etc. That's the ray pattern. If you can't find two linearly independent eigenvectors, then you have what's called a single tangent, and that could be a source or a sink. And then we have one additional pattern that doesn't have a correlation to the um, harmonic oscillator, and that's a case where the one of the eigenvalues, one or both, is zero. So here we have this case, and in that case, it'll have uh, certain equilibrium solutions will be a line. And I'll talk about those at the end of this lecture. And the um, face pattern, the face portrait, consists of parallel lines. Okay. Now here's a, a famous composite picture of all these phase portraits. And these, of course, are the canonical ones, the very nice, easy ones with axes lined up with the um, horizontal and vertical axis of the coordinate system. This parabola that you see here, oops, I'm going to write on it. Um, okay, the parabola is a case where lambda 1 equals lambda 2. 1, usually say it as one eigenvalue or a single eigenvalue, but really, of course, there's two, they just happen to be equal. That's right along this parabola. Inside the parabola are the complex conjugate pairs. These are very complex eigenvalues. Out here, I, you know, down here and down here are the two real eigenvalues where lambda 1 is not equal to lambda 2. So it's complex inside. The parabola marks the um, the region in this plane. Oh, I didn't tell you what the plane was. I'm sorry. You can kind of see it here. It's the determinant is written here, and the value of the trace of the matrix A is written there. So this is a trace determinant plane. All right. And when T, remember when T squared, you probably don't remember that, equals 4D. But when that happens, then that is, the determinant in the quadratic formula is 0. So the eigenvalues are all equal to T over 2. So you would have lambda 1 equals lambda 2 equals T over 2. That case occurs, as I'm trying to say here, on this parabola. That's what, where it's located in the, in the plane, in the TD plane, the trace determinant plane. Inside the parabola, the values of T and D are such that the eigenvalues are complex. Beneath this parabola, the values of T and D are such that the eigenvalues are real and distinct. Along this line here, you have a zero eigenvalue. Right here, you have two zero eigenvalues. They're kind of a special case. But those lie right along the t-axis. So it, this picture is in your textbook. You can find it all over the place. Just Google it. You can look at it on internet, and you will see this. Now, if you remember, um, we had a, a bifurcations, bifurcation patterns with the first equation, uh, with the first order equations. We had saddle nose, transcritical, and all those. We don't see those here. Instead, we would see the phase portraits 
merge moving along the different patterns in the TD plane. Might start as a center and as the parameter changes turns into spiral sink, goes critical and becomes a sink. That's one example of a of a uh, path that would be traced as a parameter changes or you could be going the different direction for example. All right, so we don't see those transcritical saddle nose and all those um, those bifurcation patterns. Instead we see paths in the TD plane, in the trace determinant plane. Again these are all canonical because they're nicely lined up, they're, they're symmetric and of course we want to get these images implanted in our mind. All the other images are simply distortions of these basic canonical phase portraits. We're going to look also now at the equilibrium solutions. So an equilibrium solution is similar to the one for chapter one. In chapter one, if you had a dip, um, some dy by dt equals, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it's linear or nonlinear. The equilibrium solutions are the values of y t such that this first derivative is zero. Because if the first derivative is zero, you're not going to change. The same holds here for these systems. So we have a derivative, it's a derivative of a vector, but that doesn't matter. You need the derivative of vector, the first derivative to be zero for the equilibrium solution. So y is some function, I had to erase the screen to get some room here, of x of t and y of t. So the equilibri equilibrium value would be the pair such that, okay, such that dy by dt evaluated at the equilibrium value is zero. So we're looking for x and y. So we'll send that first derivative to zero. So we'll just write out the second half of that equation. Remember dy by dt equals ay. Okay. This is capital Y. Okay. So and that has to be zero. So let's just look at a y equals zero. So a is the coefficient matrix a b c d in this case, and y is the solution vector x y. I work it out. So in, comp in component form, I have these two equations. These are two linear equations, and we know what the solutions can look like. So here we just have more algebra. So we went all the way through calculus, and calculus was a prerequisite for this class, and you spend most of your time doing algebra. Okay, well, that's how it is here. So what we had before was a system of linear equations. I'll write them here again, in case you forgot them. We have ax plus by equals zero, and we have another equation, cx plus dy equals zero. So we have two coupled or system of linear equations, and what are the possible solutions? We could have one unique solution. Well, the solution of both of these is straight line. Okay, so you have two straight lines. Where they cross or where they intersect are the solutions of the system. If they in, if they cross, they'll only cross at one point in our Euclidean space here. If they cross there, that is the solution. That would be the um, unique solution, it would be the equilibrium solution because that's what we're talking about. If they're parallel, there's no solutions, and if they are collinear, then there's an infinite number of solutions. This is just looking at the equations ax plus by equals zero and cx plus dy equals zero. Right. Okay, this solution, this case is ruled out because obviously they could, they will intersect it at um, So we only have two possibilities. Either there is one unique equilibrium solution for the system or there are an infinite number of equilibrium solutions for the system. So I wrote that here. We have the system of linear equations again. Write them again because it's hard to remember from one slide to the next. 
These are two linear equations. They graph as two lines. They can intersect at the origin and that will give one unique equilibrium solution for the system. That's called the trivial solution and it is the origin. x, y equals zero, zero. Or you will have an infinite number of solutions including zero, zero because they still intersect there. So these are the two possibilities for equilibrium solutions for these linear systems. Now we're going to take these ideas and go back to the matrix. If you have the unique trivial solution, so the equations intersect at one point, then they are not multiples of each other. If you have an infinite number of solutions so that the lines are collinear, then the equations are multiples of each other. Now think back of the determinant because we have the determinant, we had a as a coefficient a, b, c, d. If they are not multiples of each other, then the determinant of a is not zero. If they are multiples of each other, then the determinant of a is zero. So the condition now is not really on a, b, c, d anymore. We can just look at the matrix A and stay in our matrix, um, our matrix terminology for these systems. So we want to find the equilibrium solutions for a system. We look at the matrix A itself, not A minus lambda I, just A. If that determinant is not zero, there is only one equilibrium solution. That is the trivial solution, zero, zero, which is, which is the origin in the phase plane. If the determinant is zero, there are an infinite number of solutions, including the origin, and there will be a line every point on the line AX plus BY or equivalently CX plus DY, all of those will be equilibrium points. It will run through the origin so it will include that trivial solution. So that's, this is a general look at finding the eigenvalues. After this in the next lectures we're going to go through each case, the case of two um, distinct real eigenvalues, um, the complex conjugate, the equal, eigenvalues and the, um, in the in the case of zero eigenvalues and in those cases we'll find the eigenvectors. We have to find the eigenvectors in each case differently so that's why we wait until we find the eigenvalues first.